Hello, this is Professor Marsh, and this is the replacement lecture uh, for the last part of Chapter 10 uh, in your book. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, look at uh, evaluating and determining whether to sell or process further. Uh, that is uh, Section 10.5, one of our <clears throat> additional tricks that we're learning uh, in Chapter 10. Uh, and then in uh, section 10.6, we're going to evaluate and determine how to make decisions when resources are constrained. Uh, and so uh, going back to the beginning uh, of the chapter, uh, this is short-term decision-making. Uh, we've already looked at identifying the relevant information for decision-making. Uh, one of the first uh, tricks that I, as I like to call them, that we learned was whether to accept or reject a special order. Then we looked at whether or not to uh, make uh, a component or product or outsource it. Uh, then we looked at whether uh, to keep or discontinue a segment or product. Uh, and now we're looking at whether or not to sell or process further. So uh, the uh, <laughs> decision uh, to sell or process further uh, you have to look at the revenues that would be received uh, if the product is sold at the split-off point versus the revenues that would be received if the product is processed further. And then you need to know the additional costs of further processing. In other words, can you increase your contribution margin? So uh, if the differential revenue from further processing is greater than the differential costs, then it would be profitable to process a joint product after the split-off point. And think back to the beginning example in the chapter of the coffee grounds. So if they have to be reprocessed in order to be sold uh, as a fertilizer or as some other, uh, some other product, uh, then you just have to consider what are those costs and then what could you get uh, for the coffee grounds uh, to uh, use them as fertilizer or fuel. So uh, uh, <coughs> there is an example uh, and uh, you've got the uh, example of luxury leathers, uh, which produces various leather products, uh, such as belts and wallets. It's in the process of cutting out the leather pieces, uh, in the process of cutting out the leather pieces for each product. Uh, there's 400,000 pounds of scrap leather produced, and they've been selling the leather scrap to Sammy's Scrap Procurement for two twenty-five dollars a pound. And uh, they have an employee suggestion box, uh, which uh, I just happen <coughs> just happen to have a copy of a suggestion box right here uh, that we've used for uh, student comments in the past. So uh, one of the suggestions that was put in the box uh, was to use <coughs> most of the scrap to make leather watch bands. And the management of the company is interested in this idea as the machines necessary to produce the watch bands are the same ones used uh, in making belts, and you'd merely need to reprogram them for the cutting and stitching process on the watch bands. <coughs> so uh, uh, the process to attach the buckle would be the same uh, for watch bands as it is for the belts, and so that doesn't require additional work or training, uh, and they would have additional costs for new packaging and supply and insertion of the pins that connect the band to the watch. So uh, the total variable cost, this is a good example, the total variable cost uh, to produce the watch band would be $2.85. Uh, fixed cost would be increased by $85,000 per year for the lease of the packaging equipment, and luxury estimates that it could produce and sell 100,000 watch bands per year. Finished watch bands could be sold for $15 each uh, should luxury continue to sell the scrap leather or should they process the scrap into watch bands to sell? And you can see this, the uh, suggested solution here, uh, the uh, decision uh, to uh, sell uh, at uh, the scrap price. Uh, you got 40, 400,000 units, uh, 400,000 pounds uh, of scrap, and that gives you $900,000. Uh, in the effect on operating income, just 225 for the scrap times 400,000 pounds. Uh, if you process further, then your selling price is $15 uh, 
uh, per watch band and your additional variable cost is $2.85. That gives you a contribution margin of $12.15. And if you sell 100,000 units, uh, that <clears throat> at $12.15, that's additional contribution margin of 1215000 minus the additional fixed cost of 85000 and your effect on your con on your operating income uh, should be one million one hundred and thirty thousand. Uh, so that's considerably higher, two hundred and thirty thousand higher uh, than just selling the scrap. Uh, and so that's uh, that's a good decision there. And that's that's basically the analysis. And then uh, uh, you have another uh, example with the uh, uh, Apple company, uh, not Apple computers, but uh, Ainsley's apples. Uh, that uh, grows organic apples, sells them to national grocery chains. Uh, they purchased a machine for 450000 that sorts the apples by size. Largest apples are sold as loose apples to various stores. Medium-sized apples are bagged, sold to grocers in the bagged state. The smallest apples are sold to deep discounters or to a local manufacturing plant that processes them into applesauce. And they're thinking about keeping the small apples and processing them into apple juice that would be sold under their own label to local grocers. So the small apples uh, sell to the deep discounters at $1.10 per dozen. Uh, the variable cost to prepare the small apples for sale, including transportation, is 30 cents per dozen. Ainsley can sell each gallon of organic apple juice for $3.50 per gallon. It takes two dozen small apples to make one gallon of apple juice. There's a lot of, a lot of math in this problem. Uh, and the cost to produce the organic apple juice will be 60 cents uh, variable uh, cost per gallon plus 200,000 fixed cost for the one year lease of the equipment needed to make and bottle the juice. Uh, so they uh, normally harvest and sell uh, 2,400,000 small apples per year. Should they continue to sell the small apples to the local grocer and the applesauce manufacturer, should they process the apples further into apple juice? And so uh, here you can see an example where you sell it uh, uh, at the split off uh, point. You've got a uh, uh, ten as the selling price per dozen and the variable cost to sell is only 30 cents. So you have a contribution margin of 80 cents and your units sold are 200,000, uh, that's uh, uh, 200,000 dozen, okay? So uh, uh, you know, 2.4 million uh, apples equals 200,000 dozen. Uh, and uh, you have two dozen per gallon, uh, so you, uh, we'll get to that in the next one. So total contribution margin uh, for those units sold, 200,000 units uh, times 80 cents is 160,000. Now, if we process further, uh, we're going to get uh, uh, the selling price of $3.50. Our variable cost will be $0.60. Cents. Our contribution margin will be $2.90. Uh, $2 uh, but because it takes uh, two dozen of those small apples to make a gallon of juice, we're only going to have 100,000 units sold, 100,000 gallons. Uh, and the additional fixed costs, we're going to have, uh, well, we're going to have 290000 in total contribution margin, but we're going to have 200000 in additional fixed costs for that machine. So the effect on operating income would only be an increase of 90000 as compared to the 160000 uh, that we would have uh, for uh, just selling the small apples the way we have been. Uh, so. Uh, your book also encourages you to uh, think it through uh, and go back uh, to the uh, coffee ground example and uh, uh, dig up what information you need to have to evaluate between the alternatives. And you certainly need to know uh, both the fixed and variable costs of what that processing, additional processing would be uh, if you were going to uh, uh, try to make further use of those coffee grounds. Uh, so. Uh, Anyhow, that's, uh, that is section 10.5. Section 10.6 
uh, evaluating and determining how to make decisions when resources are constrained. Uh, and you can have all sorts of constraints. You can have limits, uh, you know, they're imposed uh, because of uh, uh, labor conditions, however many uh, shifts you can work uh, per day, uh, perhaps uh, related to the machinery, how fast the machinery can work. Uh, you can have uh, EPA and OSHA constraints with respect to emissions or with respect uh, to the safety of your workers uh, and, uh, you know, perhaps uh, require downtime uh, in order to service machinery. And these constraints uh, can slow down uh, production, and that's, that's what we call a bottleneck. Uh, so picture a bottle, uh, how it's fat at the bottom, skinny at the top, and uh, what happens is uh, things can only flow as fast uh, as the skinny uh, part at the top, which is why we call it a bottleneck. So uh, <clears throat> anyhow, those, uh, uh, those constraints uh, limit our production, and so uh, we have to decide sometimes we can't produce everything that we want to produce. Uh, what should we produce? And so in order to maximize uh, profitability, uh, then what we should do is we should produce and accept orders to produce uh, the orders with the highest contribution margin in relation to our scarce resources to whatever uh, the bottleneck is. So products or services should be ranked based on their unit contribution margin per production restraint. Uh, and so that way we can have the highest total contribution margin, uh, you know, with that constraint. And you get down to uh, the uh, wood world example uh, <coughs> and you can see that they produce wooden desks, chairs, and bookcases, and the items are produced using the same machines, and there's a maximum of 80,000 machine hours available during the year, so that's your constraint. And the information about the production time and the cost for these items are you've got the desks that cost, that, that, that take an hour uh, to produce, uh, chairs take 50, you know, 50 one hundredths of an hour or half an hour, and the bookcases take a quarter of an hour. The selling price for the desks are 350 for the chair 200 and for the bookcase 75 and you can see the uh, direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, and fixed overhead for uh, the various products. So uh, Woodworld is limited to producing uh, the number of uh, its products be because of the machine hours, and they've received uh, orders for 60,000 desks, 48,000 chairs, and 40,000 bookcases, which requires 94,000 machine hours to produce. Well, that's more than our 100% capacity in machine hours. And so what we do is we make some calculations with respect to the uh, uh, contribution margin uh, per unit uh, of uh, uh, each product. And it turns out that the contribution margin uh, per machine hour is the highest for the bookcases. You can see uh, the presentation there uh, in the uh, little uh, gray box uh, in your uh, material. So uh, the, the bookcases, surprisingly enough, uh, are uh, relatively inexpensive to produce, uh, and they only take a quarter of an hour. So you can make $192 uh, you know, per machine hour from producing the bookcases. So uh, the uh, decision is that Wood World should pr fulfill the order for the bookcases first. They've got an order for uh, uh, 40,000 bookcases and that's at a quarter of an hour a piece so that's 10,000 hours out of their 80,000 of available hours. I'm looking at the green box now uh, and then the remaining hours are 70,000 and then the next most profitable or the next highest contribution margin is the $185 per hour uh, from uh, the desks and so they should produce those next uh, and that's 60,000 times one those are the number of orders times the hour per desk. Remaining hours are 10,000, 
and so uh, then uh, uh, they should uh, uh, it takes a half an hour to make a chair that's the only thing they have left so they should only do 20,000 chairs now the problem with that uh, the possible uh, qualitative problem with that is that the all these people buying desks might need chairs uh, so uh, where do you get the chairs uh, so uh, you know that's uh, that's something that you uh, might be concerned about, and your book points that out as a qualitative factor. But uh, uh, anyhow, that's uh, that's the analysis, uh, at least the quantitative analysis, uh, and and some qualitative considerations uh, for uh, uh, what to do when resources are constrained. So that's that's the rest of chapter ten. Uh, good luck with your uh, you know with your studies, and we're going to move into chapter eleven. Uh, this week and uh, look forward to seeing you in class. Uh, thanks a lot and uh, uh, that is it for now. So uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.